Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Whether you're a first-time investor or you started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow, 2022 REB Buyers Agent of the Year and Rising Star finalist Lachlan Vidler and his team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take your next step in growing your portfolio. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment property. Visit atlaspropertygroup.com.au to book in your discovery call absolutely free of charge. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Okay, hey, going, Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Getting stuck into property. I've been spending a bit of time with my accountant recently. Um, and if you tuned into our recent financing focus, you would have heard me talk about this. Getting a sense for this market that we're in right now and where those opportunities lie. And if you've been tuning into this podcast for quite some time, you'll know. We're not glass half empty type of people. We're we're definitely glass half full type of people. And that's the philosophy we take to property investing. And there is a lot of headwinds out there for property investors and the property market in general. And you can choose to stick your head in the sand and hope it all goes away, or you can look to how you capitalize on the market. So you'll notice that a lot of the the thrust of my narrative, my thought, my opinions will be more so geared towards, okay, what do you do about it and how do you amplify your position to capitalize on it rather than being quite negative in that oh, look out for this look out for that stop doing everything um the sky is falling in so uh if that's the way you see the world you're probably listening to the wrong podcast there'll be some other podcasts you could probably listen to which are more so for the doomsday merchants and for those people that look for the negative in stuff rather than the positive in stuff but um irrespective of market conditions there's always a lot of positivities uh, investing in Australian real estate you need to go back and do your history lesson Go back in time over many market cycles, particularly those where you see softening markets. The clues are all there. What's going to happen when we bounce back from this current softening? Yes, we're in an environment right now of rising interest rates. RBA hiked another 50 basis point points uh, this month. I'll probably do it again next month and the month after that, and probably once again this uh, calendar year. So we are in a rising rate environment. We know why we're in that rising rate environment. If you've been tuning into this, we've been chatting about it at length, the inflationary cycle that we're in, some of the supply chain challenges as a result of COVID, war in Europe, all this sort of stuff. Um, This is just the nature of the beast. So get sense for it, get comfortable with it, get confident in your position within it, and then look for those opportunities moving forward. And there's one person who always looks for the good in markets in flux, that's Arjun Paniwal, um, good friend of uh, Smart Property Investment. He's director and head of research over and investing. I'm going to pick his brain today around how he's seen the world, particularly around the idea that a lot of investors now have recalibrated their view of the world and are out there chasing yield, thinking there is no capital growth out there. And uh, maybe they're going to be making some fractured decisions that uh, are going to undermine their portfolio moving forward. I'm not an expert in property, but Arjun certainly is. So we'll get stuck into that today. Arjun, how are you going? Always good to be on, my friend. I'm well. Don't they call you Mr. Yield? They go, if you want yield, you speak to Arjun. It's the place would, to be. <laughs> I'd replace the yield with growth, my friend. Mr. Growth. <laughs> Go for growth, Arjun. Um, I, I know you got a bit of a bee in your bonnet around um, this yield uh, scenario. And yes, rents are going up. So a lot of people say, hey, happy days. Uh, again, go back and look through your history books and you'll see what happens in, in markets and the interconnectivity between price growth negative price growth and what happens to rent. So again, all the clues are there, but you wrote a, we penned a piece, which you uh, you published on your website, investigate.com today, you recently, a bit of a blog, why it's not all about yields. Why are people getting this so wrong? Or do you think people are getting it wrong? Arjun is the question. And what are you seeing out there, mate? The two big things we're noticing is that when you see prices outperform the way they have, And then on top of that, you've seen interest rates now rising. It creates a big gap in what a rental yield is either needed or is in a marketplace to get some half decent cash flow. And so naturally, what investors tend to do, they try and look for ways to chase up this cash flow loss or slight gain to make it a bigger gain. 
and end up just looking for some very high yielding markets. But that's not the way to go in our opinion, only because yields forever change, but your purchase price and the markets that you get into are the more decisions that you want to look into because those yields will catch up eventually. And so I really wrote this piece here about making sure investors can avoid some of the mistakes with yield chasing and something we can go through in more detail today. So why'd you write it? It's obviously a, an issue that you're seeing and and, and maybe people are misinformed. Um, maybe they're getting their advice from other quarters. Maybe they're not listening to the Smart Property Investment Show, but um, it must be a significant enough phenomenon, if I can say that right, for you to want a pen and piece around it. Definitely. So I think, you know, to give you some context, when investors apply criteria for searching, they apply certain yields they want to hit, 4%, 3.5%, 4.5%, And if you keep moving this number up, the number of markets that you can possibly look at to buy goes down because there's only so many locations that have a higher yield. Now, imagine you've canceled out a few locations just because you need to hit this bullet point and these locations could have outperformed on capital growth or they might actually end up with better rental yields four years later or two years later because their rental pressure was higher. There's countless uh, locations, like example, you know, we analyzed Kabulcha versus Nambour, Wollongong versus Southern Highlands, Launceston versus Hobart. Now, looking at Hobart, the rental yield back in 2020 in a particular region was better than Launceston, the Hobart Northwest region. Now, someone looking at that goes, hey, I might go into this Hobart Northwest region. They're priced fairly similar as well to get in and buy property. But all of a sudden, the actual rental yield two years later was greater in Launceston because the purchase price that uh, the rentals that have grown there have actually grown by 29% in Launceston versus Hobart Northwest at 14%. Uh, same thing happened in Southern Highlands and Wollongong. Wollongong's rental yield looked better than Southern Highlands, but then the rental growth in Southern Highlands was higher over the last two years. And now the rental yield today is actually better. So the key thing is um, we really don't want to go chasing a certain metric to try and make your search very condensed because you end up losing the number of cities that you could be looking at to get the best result. And you actually ignore what's more important than yield. And that's actually rental pressure, which is going to make that yield lift over time. So I'll have to chat about that in a moment, Arjun, but just conscious um, maybe we should step back a bit. And um, we can't just assume that everyone who's tuning in is an experienced investor and understands what yield is and what yield does and and how it um, fits into the property investment equation. Let's let's for, for our beginner investors, uh, Arjun, for those that are probably need a refresher, what is yield? So yield is your annual rental income. So whatever you're getting a week times 52 divided by the purchase price, and that equals rental yield. And it's expressed as a percentage. So a simple number for everyone to get right is if you had a $500,000 property, you remove the zeros at the end and you had 500 per week in rent, it equals a yield of 5.2%. Gross and gross meaning before you pay your rates, water, insurances, and other stuff. So that's a, a crash course on rental yields. Yeah, and when I think about how I have things organised uh, and where I map um, my portfolio, I, I probably have a probably have a number of yield metrics. Um, traditionally, it's against the purchase price. So if you bought a property twenty years ago, you're going to have a very different yield if you bought that same property today, right? Because it's what you paid for it then. Now, I look, I look at yield at purchase price. I look at yield as a correlation to the total purchase price, as in what are the cost me to secure the assets? So that includes stamp duty uh, and any other associated fees around it. Then I also do an equation based on current market value. Um, and you say, well, what do you do that, Phil? Well, it gives me a sense for how the, the property is performing given any time because yield is a product of when you purchase the property. Um, but what's your view towards that, Arjun? Do you sort of keep it base and just do it against the immediacy of buying a property today? So is it you're securing a property and if you secure it today, it's going to be against this yield versus a property that's been in the portfolio for many, many years. Does it become irrelevant? Yeah, so it's a really good point you raised, Phil, and this is the key part with rental yield. If rents rise over time, which they no doubt will, what many people forget is that your purchase price remains locked in. So if you bought a $500,000 property five years ago and the rent was 400 a week, 
with that sort of rental yield, people may look at it and go, hey, you know, do I feel as happy for that rental yield on a $400 per week against a 500,000, which is 4.16. Whereas a few years go by, rents start rising and then out at 500 a week, you're back up at 5.2. And this is the piece many investors miss. They constantly go in to chase a market, try and hit a certain number. And they go, hey, no, I'm not going to look at this city or that property because instead of getting my number of 4.5, which on a $500,000 property is a number of what, you know, between 450, 460. Whereas, you know, they might be missing out on three cities that probably only rent for 420. Do you really care about the $40 today? Or do you care about what that market will do ahead? And that's more important. So I think that's a key piece that we need to focus on your purchase prices locked in today, your rents will catch up. And that's what's going to drive your yield up and up. At this time of buying, we should be looking at yield against the purchase price, but you should also note the cities because one simple rule that we apply, I'll give you an example, Townsville, Toowoomba, these sorts of cities in Queensland, there are outgoings from council rates, property management, insurances, things like that. They're a bit higher than some of your other cities. So we want to take a benchmark across Australia, You know, the likes of Sydney or the likes of Adelaide, Brisbane, city council, they offer a benchmark of what's a typical, you know, your bills on a property from rates, water insurance, and then how high it is in other cities, you compare it against if that property was in Sydney, what would the rent be? So give you a small example. We found out that there's a rule of $40 in Townsville. Whereas if you were to buy a, a property and it rented for 500 a week to get the same equivalent rental in Adelaide, you'd only have to get 460 a week. So we just apply these rules to normalize it because some investors get very excited about an epic rental yield and they start to think, wow, that rental yield's phenomenal, but you've got to dig deeper as well to get the actual bills and after. Yeah, there's so many discrepancies and in individual factors which shape yield. And you, know, you can go out to Broken Hill and probably get a yield of 20%, right? Guess what? You're probably paying about 150 grand for the asset. And yields can get a lot worse over time. And I think about a property uh, in the Smart Property Investment Portfolio. It's out in uh, Mount Coringai, which I think when we bought that, call it 600 grand, right? We're getting about 700 bucks a week rent, 720 by memory. Now, that same property today is worth about 1.1 million bucks, and we're getting about 670 bucks a week rent. So, you know, the rent on that today versus when we first secured is a very, very different proposition. Now we've had accelerated capital growth, but the rents haven't kept up. They've gone, they've gone backwards, to be fair. And that's a product of a rising rate environment. And now you get this recalibration of it where those rents should start going up as a product of softening markets. So the yields will increase. But you know, it goes back to the point, Arjun. If you go out there chasing yields, in many ways you're chasing unicorns because it is very different irrespective of where you go and how you do it and the asset that you choose to invest in. Why do people get so obsessed with yields? And I would sort of put that in the context also of how some people sell properties. Uh, if you look at sort of off-the-plan apartments or that sort of stuff, they'll, they'll the, the front end of the marketing won't be, hey, guess what? You're probably going to have this capital growth. It's going to be secure this yield today, get these huge depreciation benefits, which is even going to make it easier from a cash flow perspective to hold your property and it makes it a good investment. Is that a big question mark for you when you see that sort of stuff? Yeah, I think uh, you know, making it a good investment of yield is never a good way to start your journey. I think when it comes to investing, we've got to look at the drivers of the location and the pressure of those rental markets that will see the yields rise. You know, I've seen so many location examples where today location A and location B kind of like a, the, what was the story? The hare, the tortoise, that sort of thing. So we've got one that's, you know, rising at, it looks phenomenal on the way in off the plan, trying to say something here at 550 a week, the rental yield looks phenomenal, but supply kicks in, you know, the market's full of investors, the pressure's not quite high, vacancy rate lifts up. And you get a great starting point. You've got one foot ahead of it, but then it just stays there. So what's actually going to be more important is even if you had a location that rented at $50 less, is that $50 less going to catch up to it in year two or three, go up higher at year five or six? And that's what we're looking for. But I think just on that point of 
you know, the choices investors make. You touched on one, which was the idea of, you know, people chasing newer stuff to get those fancier yields at the time of buying or even get depreciation to try and make up some of that weaker cash flow. But I've actually noted down another, you know, five bullet points here that I can run through where investors during times like this, where prices have outpaced rents and interest rates are going up, will make some mistakes. Is it cool if I run through some of those, Phil? Yeah, I'd like you to do that. Um, before we do, Arjun, I just want to just conclude this particular point and your views on it. A lot of people think yield and cash flow are interconnected and interchangeable. Uh, they talk about it in the same breath. Yield is very, very different to cash flow, isn't it? Yeah, very different. And and you know, just even those examples of some of the Queensland markets or even some out in, in WA, like you've got markets in Perth that have a 10% property management rate. Mm. Uh, that yield might look fancy. But how do you go on the opposite end to actually really go, what am I taking home as part of managing this investment for my household? Yeah. And yield doesn't take into any way or any consideration how much debt you have against property. It's just a a product of how much money you're generating versus the purchase price. It doesn't count debt for what debt you have on it. So one person's cash flow on a high yielding property could be very different than one person's cash flow carrying more debt on that same property. But Arjun, let's get into those points. We'll go to a quick break beforehand. Uh, Stay with us back in a moment. Ever wondered how you can invest like the top 1% of Australian property investors? Henderson Advocacy has been at the forefront of helping everyday Aussies improve their financial freedom. So if you're a savvy investor or someone just starting out on their property journey, give Henderson Advocacy a call today. Head to www.henderson.com.au. Don't invest alone. Invest smarter. Welcome back, everyone. It's Phil Tarrin, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm with Arjun Paliwell, Director and Head of Research over at Investigate. Now, Arjun, give us a secret source, these five points that we touched on just before the break. Yeah, so many investors, unfortunately, will make a few poor choices during these times, Phil. And five points that I thought of outside of that first point we mentioned of people chasing newer stuff to you know, get up those higher rental yields or depreciation. But five other points are the first thing people do is jump to units and townhouses. They go, hey, things are cheap. The rental yields are better. Costs are rising. House prices have grown so quickly. And there's this belief of okay, I should get a better rental yield here in a unit of townhouse. So maybe I should make this my purchase, especially as I'm a bit cost conscious during this changing environment. The second point is people will chase a compromised property. And this is an important one because it's very hard to tell on the surface. What usually happens is within a suburb, similar properties, when I say similar, I mean similar beds and baths through different patches of a suburb, different streets, main roads run in front of a substation or not in front of a substation, cul-de-sacs and other things, they will sell at different price points because there are reasons why people may choose to live in that patch or not live in that patch. And what happens is that to get a cheaper purchase price and improve your rental yield, people might pick up a more compromised property within that region or something that probably isn't stacking up just to make that rental yield balance in times where costs are rising. The third point here is people will cut off many locations. Imagine you've got 20 locations across Australia that have a rental yield of 4% plus. And then now you go, well, I want 5% plus, and now you're down to five. I want 5.5% plus, I'm down to two. What do you know that you could be saying no to when it comes to areas, markets, growth drivers, when really when you break down what a 4.5 or a 5 or a 4 looks like, you're talking between $20 and $50 a week. So it's, it's unreal how many investors during these times will start to go, I'll forego $20 to $50 a week in gain or loss just to simply tick a box versus how many cities do you let go as a result. And then um, the last two parts is some people actually try and chase a property with an X factor thinking that, hey, this is what you need to do in these markets. You know, an X factor being, I've never done development before, but I want to put in a granny flat. I want to make sure that I can subdivide this property. I want to make sure that it's big enough land. And then they're prone to make mistakes because this sort of asset or this sort of due diligence is new to them just because they really want to make up the yield. And I've seen a story actually recently, Phil, where 
someone had actually purchased a property out in Western Sydney with granny flat potential in as part of their portfolio in one of our portfolio reviews. Uh, it was a big X factor for them to try and get all this potential in there so they could counteract the interest rates that are rising. They've just gone through their due diligence process. And unfortunately, they've been stung with the fact that can't even work on the site. So um, these are the sort of mistakes that people can go into and in trying to chase the X factor when you don't do your due diligence right in trying to make up lost yield. And the last one, the fifth and final point is people don't buy at all because they have a fear of weaker cash flows. Mm. Not realizing that the weaker cash flows of today are actually temporary in nature because rents in fact rise over time whilst you've got your asset and debt that either stay as is or go down. And again, rents help with the yield equation, but rents can move um, drastically up and down. However, if you're still pegging your yield against the purchase price, the number becomes irrelevant. And I guess that's probably where most people need to be thinking about is what is the appropriate rent for a specific property at any given time based on the market condition in those areas. Now, rents can certainly help with cash flow. Uh, rents can be a, a big driver at, I guess, the um, revenue line in cash flows. Um, uh, you know, again, your cash flow is going to be a product of how much debt that you have. If I have this, the same property argent that you have and we've got a different debt position on it, it's going to change exactly what the cash position is, positive cash flow and negative cash flow on it. And going back to what we spoke about earlier, how people sometimes front end the attractiveness of the property would be selling it on, hey, this is a high yielding property or uh, we've got a, a, a rental guarantee on a particular property or you should buy this property for the benefits of depreciation, or you should buy this property for the benefits of negative gearing. These are all things, sometimes Arjun, um, smoke and mirrors, which may be propping up what is potentially not a very investable property. So these are all pretty complicated terms and theories that we're coming up with with here, Arjun. But one thing you said to me, which I really want to sort of dig into a bit, and that was that third point, cut off too many investing locations by making budgets too low. That there is, so someone's having a blanket approach saying, I'm going to start investing in property. And the first criteria I'm going to have is around whether the yield is above or below 5% as the, the primary factor that's going to shape their search. So they could be removing 95% of all properties in Australia if they take a particular view on that. How often has that happened? How many people do you come across that go, or you chat to a potential client going, Arjun, I only want a property if it's got a 5% yield. I don't want anything it, else. It's happened more than ever before over the last four months since interest rates have been rising. Well, been why very, is that? Why is that? Because it's been a very a, interesting chat. Yeah. Why do you think that? Like, do people think I need to be higher yielding because it means I'm going to generate more revenue on it and therefore I can buttress rising interest rates? Is that the logic? Yeah, that's definitely the logic. It's kind of partially to do with the interest rates rising, but it's also to do with there was unexpected and the timing of the rise and how fast it's happened to them. I think that's probably one of the biggest things that's happening across Australia right now is the change in buyer behavior, not by the fact that rates are rising, but the fact by how quickly, how opposite it was to the statements of the RBA. And that no doubt just puts people through a period of adjustment. And one of the adjustments you can do in buying property is the purchase price. And the other adjustment that you can do is the yield. Mm -hmm. So we're actually seeing people with borrowing capacities between 700K to 1 million for purchase price come in and say, I want to purchase below 600K, which is, look, that's fine. Risk mitigation, comforts, purchase prices, no, no issues there. But when you break down the underlying reason, it's like, well, I hear that in cheaper purchase prices, we get better yields. Mm. Well, true. That is right. But I mean, with a budget that well-placed, and like you said, you're ruling out 90% or 95% of markets. Do you feel based on what you have or want to build in your portfolio, you have enough markets here to make the best decision possible? And that's what investing is about. How can I reduce opportunity costs by making the best decisions available to me. And if you apply too hard of a rental yield simply to chase the interest rates, then you're moving your property investing that's a long-term game with a short-term metric. And that's the thing that people need to avoid. So how many people are going to make the mistake of choosing the wrong assets in this current market we're in that's going to have maybe decisions 
to uh, combat a 12 month to 18 month uh, scenario that may impact you know multiple decades of upsides of property investing people are going to make that mistake aren't they totally and i think that's what you know today's chat's all about just helping people see it in more deeper numbers and insights of the mistakes that people can make i can recall very very clearly some properties that I've seen that are seeing some huge rental pressure. I'll talk about one of my Central Coast examples in my own portfolio, Phil. Mm. I understood that the yields weren't as well placed as they should have been, being a coastal pocket, being more pricey, a point of just over a million bucks, I think around 1.2, 1.3. But just since November to now, Phil, I'm not saying I've increased the rents by this much, but the market has increased by this much. And what I estimated the rents to be at the time was about 680 to 720. Now property managers for the same property are saying that, hey, you could get 850. So the yield is changing very rapidly. However, guess what? I would have not even considered a market like that if I'd put my guards up to have a certain yield. And if this pressure keeps building in the rents, well, guess guess what? Might might hit a thousand dollars one day and thousand dollars rent on a 1.2, 1.3 purchase price is a very well placed asset especially when you start getting the levels of growth on it as well. So I think this is just one example. All over the place, people need to be looking at the real demand of housing in that area, which is going to put pressure on rents rather than the buy-in number and the actual percentage you walk out with. Yeah, and and you keep mentioning this uh, rental pressure, and it's probably something we need to dig into. Uh, We'll just go to another break. Back in a moment, everyone. It's time to get help. Interest rates are increasing. Inflation has hit an extraordinary 5.1% and the chance to secure a golden egg property is getting narrower by the day. Dragon from Buyers Agency Australia has been presenting the facts and helping property investors make smarter, well-informed, educated decisions in property for years. So what are you waiting for? Get in touch with Dragon today at www.buyersagencyaustralia.com.au. Invest with integrity. Welcome back, Phil Tarrant, uh, Arjun Paliwell from Investigate, chatting through the folly of chasing yield. I reckon there is some, you've got to be conscious of the yield, but it probably shouldn't be the primary investing factor that you use to shape where and how and what you do buy. And we're chatting around um, uh, rental pressure, Arjun, and you talk about there the, the Central Coast. I sold a place up on the Central Coast last year sometime. Good luck trying to find rental property on the Central Coast at the moment. Uh, they are as rare as hen's teeth. And I think they're probably going to become even rarer as property markets soften and you're going to get more first-home buyers looking to enter the market. And that's the sort of stuff that typically investors buy up on the Central Coast that first-home buyers are getting. That The place that we sold, which was an investment property, was sold to first-home buyers who are parting it up now and um, trying to make it their home. And, and that's really cool. And they're doing a really good job of it. Uh, you probably, for those of you who have Followed that's up in um in Berkeleyvale on the Central Coast, but Arjun, there is a lot of reasons why there's going to be increased pressure on rents uh, moving forward, and 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 it's fundamental to property investment. We should probably chat about it a little bit because I know um you do put research at the uh, fore of most of your um, support for your clients. Now, why are rents going up? Well. Really simply, again, it's 101 stuff, supply and demand. If there's not enough rental properties, that means there's more demand for them and therefore positive rental pressure on that. So there's not enough around, therefore price goes up. That's basic sort of uh, economics. Now, to uh, exacerbate that, uh, we're in an environment where we don't have a lot of uh, international migration and or there's a bit of intrastate migration going in particular directions. So we haven't yet seen this glut of people choosing to call Australia home from other parts of the world, that that is happening and, and will happen at pace. One of the other parts of this rental pressure equation, Arjun, is the fact that building approvals have been super low and have been COVID impact as well. Sort of strengthening that negative position also is that try and build yourself something these days, um, building materials 30 40% more increase, uh, you can't get tradies, all that sort of stuff. So you've got all these factors, which means that we're probably going to have even more rental shortages, which is therefore going to put more rental pressure in time. So not good news for renters, uh, for those people looking for houses. And I only picked through the Daily Telegraph today, they're talking about how it's an absolute crisis for a lot of people who do rent. They can't simply just find stuff. They're living in caravan parks. Um, 
The good news, if there is a good news from it, is that for property investors, and this is a podcast around property investing, is that you should get upwards pressure on your rents, which means you could probably push your prices up in a way in which is consistent and considerate to that sort of social impact connected with it as well. So Arjun, there's only going to be more pressure on rents. How do you sort of frame it? How do you see this as a way in which you can, as a property investor, look to, to amplify your investment potential? Yeah, there's a big, big pressure level on rents. And as you pointed out, that's even without some of the extreme levels of migration that Australia is typically known for. So I think firstly, understanding some of the reasons why this rental boom is is here is there's just a, a few different things going on in Australia right now. So firstly, house prices increasing are definitely making people stay in the rental market longer. You know, to give you some context, ING had a look at the national average age of first home buyers in the early 1990s, Phil, and that was around 27. Mm. Whereas a few decades later, this number is now 36. And so, you know, Home Start Finance as well recently reviewed that at the end of 2021, that people aged over 40 made up almost a quarter of all their first home lenders, up from just 9% 10 years ago. So it just shows that those decisions are coming in longer. People are renting in for longer, but that's one thing. The list goes on. Some other things are increasing demand for detached houses. RBA releases a lot of good data alongside Roy Morgan. And one of the big things we noticed was the drop in people leaving share housing, the increase in number of people living with partners. And as a result, the average household size has been dropping across Australia. So more and more people occupying more homes versus everyone piling up as one. This is common with some generational shifts that are happening, Phil, as that Gen Y age group does enter you know, family formation stage. But as for rental supply itself, it's not helping that constant pressure against investors, laws, lending changes, poor government policies and taxes. They're removing the motivation for many investors to get in over the last five, six, seven years that have happened and piled up. And the government's definitely not building more social housing as a long-term trend. So all of this coming together is creating the rental crisis that we have here today. So um, that's kind of the reasons why. But as for investors, Phil, when it comes to their challenges or, or I guess how they can consider this in their portfolio, is the rental boom means that, you know, people should remain patient. As an investor, if you're seeing a rent at 500 dollars per week today against a 600k asset and all of a sudden you start to see these rental pressures kick in and rents move up to 550 or 600 over time that's the power of patience because you know if you wind the clock 2 years forward without telling me it's 2 years forward and you go hey arjun here's a 600k property for 600 dollars a week rent would you take it I mean that would definitely be something of interest for me to review but guess what today that property is not renting for 600 a week. It's probably renting at around 500 a week. So as an investor, patience during a rental boom will really help you in the long term because as we see these rents rise, it's definitely going to help investors carry some of the costs that we're seeing. Yeah, and just to note the point around the societal impact of uh, rent pressure, it's um, it's not a good position we're in right now. And, no. And, and uh, depending on which media you choose to consume, you'll get different views of that. But there's a lot of Aussies out there doing it rough, uh, Arjun, yes. and we just want to acknowledge that. Uh, but, I, you know, again, it reinforces a, a podcast around property investing and, and property investors, uh, while it's nice to be able to, be part of the ecosystem to provide housing for Australians. Uh, it's also an investment, first of all. So if you are investing in property, you need to be across uh, this situation. Now, it's incumbent on the government to make sure that there is enough housing out there to feed, to house the masses. And that is a governmental concern. And hopefully um, the right people are doing the right things at the moment. But it's like a t- trying to turn a ship, Arjun, a tail stop a ship, a turn a ship, whatever analogy you want to use. It takes a long time. They can't miraculously, you know, yeah. build a hundred thousand houses for Australians. Like it is a, it's a compounding problem, and it will continue to compound over the time. So these things need to work in lockstep, and you get stuck into it. You know, the the onerous red tape around planning approvals to get anything built these days is nearly impossible. And then you see the the issue of the quality of buildings that have been built. You only know, need to think of, 
you know, um, some of the tower construction recently and the fact that you can't live in them. So, you know, it does need good regulatory and bureaucratic oversight to make sure the right stuff's getting done. But my suggestion to the government was, hey, get in the business of building properties for Australians uh, because uh, the only way in which we can navigate Australia's future is through a solid growth in our population base from talented people all over Australia. We're not making enough babies here, Arjun. So we need to need to get the right Aussies, uh, people to call Australia home moving forward, but they need to live somewhere now. Arjun, the question I've got for you, and you talk about this increasing detached demand for detached dwellings. Now, I've got a lot of places out in the western suburbs of Sydney, which is traditionally for investors, new Australians or new to Australian residents or immigrants are uh, normally rent that sort of stuff. And that's not happening at the moment. So I'm seeing a, a very much a two-speed rental market where your houses uh, in, in attractive assets are doing well, but there's still negative pressure on a lot of apartment rentals. Um, and I think out to the Western suburbs. So what's your read of all this? Will that catch up over time? Yeah, look, it will catch up over time on the apartment rentals. I are think you seeing all- the same thing? You still, you, you're seeing a sort of softening demand of uh, rents? Because again, put in the context, you read the paper, you can't get a house in Australia, right? Um, mm. But then if I look to Mount Druid, for example, or a Whalen or a Tregear or a St Mary's units, there's quite a few out there and the demand isn't as high. And I've had to reduce some of my rents as a result of it. Yeah, I think there's also one thing to note that, you know, the international migration piece, some of our biggest recipients in the countries that, you know, they come from in Asia, the housing models in society over there, like I come from an Indian background and it's very common to live in you know, apartments, units, things like that. And that hasn't been as part of Australian culture for as long as it has been overseas. So I have no doubt that as that sort of does kick on, that that will improve that area. But you touched on a little bit earlier about some of the negative sentiments to the way these places are built, the way, you know, they're managed. And as a result, they haven't added a a lot of positive appetite to, you know, that attractiveness of renting these apartments. But I do think over time, Phil, we do have a few uh, recommendations and suggestions, in my opinion, similar to some of the stuff that you've mentioned that will ease the rental pressure in Australia. I think the first thing, you know, is improvements of our planning system. Like you said, Mm. other things are reducing the taxation charges on new builds. There was a 2017 AFR report and the government's take on a block of land can be as much as 40% of total costs when you start to include everything, the infrastructure, the GST, land tax, development fees. It's massive. So that was the second thing. You know, there's so much cutting along the way to bring on that supply. And, and that's the irony of it all, because what a great way for the government to fill their coffers by allowing simpler rules around construction. However, they overburden it with unnecessary, sometimes compliance that stifles it. So it's a real catch-22. Sometimes you've got to sit there and just go, hang on a second, we need places, build them, and you can earn on the way through. Sometimes you've got to question it. You know, I don't know, maybe me and you should be in the big house down there in um, Canberra, Arjun, um, facilitating this sort of stuff. And I, I read a really good uh, piece from you, and I don't want to be negative about rents uh, at all, and and there is definitely a two-speed market. And you said you only need to drive out to the airport and go past Alexandra mate, uh, at night time. And guess what? There's not many places with lights on. You know, there's still a lot of empty apartments out there. Uh, so it is definitely a two-speed market. But to that point, though, there is some suburbs and regions, particularly regions, where rents will continue to surge. If we've got another couple of minutes, mate, can you give us a few of them? I know you you don't mind talking about this stuff, whereas some people hold it pretty tight to the chest. If you are looking for, if you've got assets in these areas, you should be looking to lift your rents or considering where you're getting good rents, where should you be sniffing around, mate? Definitely. We actually highlighted 20 regions, Phil, and um, I'll do a quick run through from them. So in our capital cities, we've definitely got Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart, Canberra, mm. almost all of them. It's the big standouts. Yes, there's some strengthening markets in Sydney and Melbourne too, but not to the level of these ones. But as for regional Australia, if we're down in Tassie, Devonport and Burnie are the two standouts. Out to Queensland, we've got the region of Narang, Bundaberg, Maryborough, Budrum, and Toowoomba. And then if we're heading out to New South Wales, uh, Quinbian, neighbouring the ACT, uh, Lake Macquarie and Central Coast regions, Kayama, Shell Harbour, Wagga, and uh, finish it off with our friends in SA and uh, Vic. And I apologize to regional WA and NT. This is a very hard list to make it down to 20, but Wagga Wagga, Barossa, York Peninsula, 
Warrnambool and Shepparton. So the number of locations fill across Australia with below 1% vacancies are unreal. So for us to then cull that down to 20, we had to look at many things, rental days on market, rental vacancy, rental pressure, long-term versus short-term cycle, uh, a lot of stuff to look into to come up with that list. And that's your research you come up with that? That was your-, your That's right. That's our investigate yeah. research, a report called 20 Regions Where Rents Will Continue Surging. Mm. And that's by Investigate. And you can find that on the white paper section, investigate.com.au. Yeah, go and check it out. And I've sort of, other people are producing similar reports. Um, I've done a bit of a write-up on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And you mentioned Lake Wood Quarry. There's some areas, I, I think it was on realestate.com by memory, where they identified a, a heap of a heap of suburbs uh, in the northern central coast, which sort of borders onto Lake Macquarie, that sort of the intersection between Central Coast Council and Lake Macquarie Council, places like um, Cunnawall, Gorican, Lake Haven, Charm Haven, which is sort of just pressing on that Lake Macquarie thing as well. They reckon that rents are going nuts up there as well. Good luck trying to find a place, pretty much. Yeah, big time. At the Central Coast, we're seeing a lot of rental increases, and um, there's still, uh, I guess, still the main thing I find is. When will we learn around investor friendliness? Um, because that's a part that still stumps me today, even with the Queensland land tax and other things. Um, we need our, our people in the positions of power to really, really pick up that investors help this equation. And that's going mm. to be a big piece moving ahead. Excellent. All right, Arjun. Mate, we've done pretty well there, I reckon. Mate, the key part, don't go yield chasing. The yields will come. Don't chase yields. Be conscious of the yields, but don't chase yields. Don't put yields at the front of your metrics for choosing places to invest in. It would be, uh, in my very simple, filtering ways, how I'd frame it. Um, have a look at it and look at it over time, what's happening. But um, uh, again, how you choose to calculate yields will be very much determine the makeup of your portfolio and how to move forward. It's good, Arjun. Nice that you come in and share all these uh, these insights um, with the Smart Property Investment crew. You mentioned that you've got all this stuff, white papers. That's on investorkit.com. That's your website. Um, people can find you there as well if they want to have a chat. Yeah, they can find us there. We actually just released this week Australia's Housing Fundamentals, a, a deep dive into 25 fundamentals in Australia. A lot of, uh, actually, it was our deepest white paper at the moment. would encourage mm. people to check that out. It's free to download on investigate.com.au. Do, do, you, do you have like a 70-inch TV that you use as a computer monitor so you can stick all your spreadsheets on one screen? Oh, mate, I've got multiple screens here. You know, it's my, my neck gets sore going left, right, up, down, just looking all around and trying to trying to make sure we've got all the right charts in place. He does love research, uh, and he is uh, the man behind the Property Nerds as well, uh, which is uh, broadcast across the Property Investment Podcast Network, where you're probably listening to this right now, so go turn into that. Deep dives in the data, Arjun Palawal, Director and Head of Research. Investigate, thanks for your time today. Thank you, mate. Also, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. Uh, we'll get Arjun back again. Any questions for Arjun, you can email the team here and we can answer them on air. Uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com. Did you send them through? I'm sure Arjun's happy to answer anything and I'll give my two cents on stuff as well if that's what you want. Uh, remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com. Did use social media, Smart Property HQ is where you'll find us. See you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. It's safe to say the property market has been red hot over the last few years, with some of the markets we've selected in 2021 rising over 40% in a 12-month period. It's very likely that if you're a property owner, your property has gone up 20% minimum in value in the past 12 months, and you have most likely accrued sizable equity that can be recycled and extracted to build your investment portfolio. With interest rates increasing, you might be wondering where to invest to maximise capital growth and cash flow in 2022 and beyond. Well, to save you time, energy and guesswork, award-winning author and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment podcast, Paul Glossop and his team at Pure Property Investment have outlined the top 30 affordable suburbs poised for strong capital growth over the next few years with sound cash flow. Grab your free Top 30 Guide to Property Investment Guide today at purepropertyinvestment.com.